Hi, um, I'm Jackie Hidalgo. Um, I'm currently serving as Associate Dean for Institutional Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, as well as Chair of the Latina Latino Studies Program at Williams College, where I'm also a Professor of Latina Latino Studies and Religion. So greetings from the Chilear Northeast. Um, I'll also say I have been a student of Vincent Wimbush's for a while, so it's a great honor to be invited to rejoin you all here. Um, I was realizing today that I've been a student of his uh, for as long as many of my own students have been alive. So I won't say more than that, but it means I've also known Velma about that long too, but I won't say more than that either. It's of course an honor to get to join um, you today virtually. I, I wish it was in person. It would be so wonderful to see you and, and others again. Um, thank you, Dr. Wimbush as ever for the invitation to engage with your work, which are always complicated um, and nourishing ideas at the same time. And thank you to those at Pitt's Theological Library, especially Bo Adams and Jamie Bostick and others who worked to make this exhibition and symposium possible. I'm sorry I could not witness this exhibition in person, but perhaps this digital version is more apropos to the logics of masquerade, to this play with and signification on the very notions of museum and exhibition, where we have all been challenged to ask of this masquerade, what is being exhibited, what is on display, for whom, and with what orientations. Um, as Dr. Wimbush pointed out in his opening remarks, we meet virtually to reflect on masking in an era of enforced masking, where many of us must continue to literally mask, at least in part because of, quote, counter masquerade, end quote. Um, that demand all people should risk death so that some can maintain their freedom to infect, so they can maintain the lives of their domination. Directing our attention in stage one of this exhibition, Dr. Wimbush notes, quote, that complex social life entails masking. The cult of masking, ritual masquerade for the sake of basic communication and structuring of and orientation to the world, end quote. In my remarks today, I want to focus on this recognition that there is no social world unmasked. No one holds or should hold the power to fully expose. What I think this exhibition points us toward is not a, a process of becoming unveiled or unmasked so much as requiring that we all think more carefully and more pointedly about different masks and their consequences. We live in a moment where we are more publicly and across platforms able to name the lies that drive white supremacy, the particularly gruesome masquerade that as Dr. Wimbush observes has made quote, the black flesh to serve as fraught synecdoche for the construction of modernities, end quote. Among popular and current lies of a white supremacist inflected masquerade is that quote, counter masquerade, end quote a refusal to mask for the sake of others, a refusal to wear a mask that might serve a complex social life. It manifests a fear of being marked, a yearning to keep one's mask seemingly unremarked upon, a fear and yearning that are so severe that vaccines must be avoided because of their potential to mark. Likely all of us here have read of or spoken with the specific anti-vaxxers who have chained themselves within a particular masquerade around the book of Revelation, a masquerade in which they imagine themselves to be unmarked, to be especially capable of and especially anxious about evading the quote, mark of the beast, end quote, described in Revelation 13. Thus this exhibition at this moment in time provided me an opportunity to return again to a text I keep attempting to flee, but I seem never to evade. Its very title has too often served as a privileged menonym, or in the lingo of, lingo of Facebook these days, perhaps just the meta of scripturalization. I return to the book of Revelation and to some of its legacies in the apocalyptic Americas that it has helped shape, because these legacies remind me that we may live under the legacies of apocalypse, but this is not an apocalypse. If we are lucky, it is an apocalypso. As historical critics have often constructed revelation, the text may be understood as a signifying play on Roman domination, on one historical empire's masquerade. And critics like Christopher Verlingos have drawn our attention to how the Roman empire used spectacle, 
how it attempted to put people and goods on display, perhaps not unlike our modern museums, as part of their attempts, Roman attempts, to tell a smooth story of control. The Book of Revelation is itself not very smooth, however. Indeed, its narrative is almost impossible for moderns to follow, but perhaps that too is masquerade, an attempt to disrupt Roman management of meaning, to disrupt Roman spectacle through its own spectacular. In Revelation 13, the much dreaded mark can mean many things, though I don't think a vaccine is among them. It may refer to the likeness of the Roman emperor on money or to the tattooed flesh of those enslaved. Of course, few interpreters remark upon how all humans in Revelation are ultimately marked as enslaved to Satan or to Christ, something that Chanel T. Smith examines more closely in her study of the woman Babylon. And while I imagine there might be much to say about Revelation's metonymy in relationship to scripturalization as enslavement, I want to focus on what, what Smith does with the veil, a central, if still fraught synecdoche of the apocalypse. Our very term for the book of Revelation, apocalypse, comes from the Greek verb, comes from the Greek verb to reveal, to unveil. But it can also mean to uncover the head, and it's close to the verb for unveiling a bride. The name of the book in Greek encodes a notion of revelation that may have a certain gendered resonance of bridal unveiling. And even as we might understand the whole book as a long unveiling, it culminates in two particularly striking unveilings of two cities figured as women. Situated within a culture of spectacle, this insistence on removing a veil to expose another truer story relies on the power of seeing and being seen and the capacity to see through. Demonic Roman lies are unveiled in order to expose superior divine truths. But the exposed are figured as women. The Roman villain presented to us in the guise of the woman Babylon is violently stripped and exposed as part of her destruction. Her counterpoint is the virginal bride city also to be unveiled, the new Jerusalem who descends from heaven near the end of the book. Of course, a lot depends on how you read Babylon and the new Jerusalem and who you are when you read about them and what you do with what you've read. When this privileged metaphor of veiling and unveiling entwines itself within modern structures of knowledge making, something Eleanor Craig has traced in her examination of Giorgio Agamben's, Agamben's work on their life, a framework of revelation becomes a framework of power knowledge, of meaning management that is both gendered and raced in terms of who has the power to unveil and to expose and who at the same time remains obscured, exposing truth, but themselves unexposed. And there is not enough time here to also point to the other colonial legacies, particularly for Muslim women of an obsession with literal veiling and unveiling by the likes of certain critics. This structuring of the veiling metaphor in knowledge, though, relies on and perpetuates a binary framework, an epistemological hierarchy with those who are exposed subordinate to those who expose. However, some modern minoritized critics model a different and less binary use of the veil. For British Australian scholar Sarah Ahmed, for instance, the critic is not the one who removes the veil, laying bare the other side. Instead, quote, the veil is not unveiled to reveal the truth. The veil is revealed, which is a revelation that must be partial and flawed, end quote. Returning to Chanel Smith and her womanist hermeneutics of ambivalence, reading Babylon presented both as imperial monster and enslaved woman reveals a veil in this world. As Smith says, quote, the, the veil reflects back to me, the particularized veil in my own life, end quote. In this way, Smith draws upon the veil as found in W.E.B. Du Bois in order to reimagine the act of reading Revelation as an opportunity, perhaps akin to how Wimbush describes, quote, if not to throw off all the masks, at least to see through their experiences and gestures, to gain heightened self-awareness of the masquerade that defines all human foibles and strivings in the world after contact with difference, end quote. Smith's ambivalence and Wimbush's seeing through present a different metaphoric structure of knowledge, not the apocalyptic binary of exposer and exposed. In Du Bois's chapter of the passing of the firstborn, he describes his baby boy as born, quote, within the veil, end quote, 
But he also says that he, quote, heard in his baby voice the voice of the prophet that was to rise within the veil, end quote. Du Bois here refers to the veil of color, a way of understanding the double consciousness through which African Americans must encounter themselves and their world, seeing both through dominant white perceptions and their own. As Ebony Marshall Terman has argued, Du Bois does not necessarily only refer to a bridal veil in the apocalypse, as he may also refer to the Jerusalem temple veil that separates out the Holy of Holies. In his chapter, Du Bois articulates a sense of epistemic authority grounded in seemingly revelatory prophecy, but this prophet does not see beyond the veil. Rather, the prophet speaks from within it. Du Bois offers a third space within the veil, a metaphor of knowledge power that plays within and without the structuring binary of revelation. Reviewing this online exhibition, itself structured around Equiano Vasa's uh, capacity to speak to and within the veil, to signify on the scriptural, does not take us beyond the veil, but it instead offers a structuring metaphor for knowledge making that is akin to, but not the same as unveiling. It is the metaphor of masking and unmasking. The exhibition as witness to and part of a masquerade that is scripturalization, the violence it has wrought on black flesh peoples, and then in stage four, the presentation of black mimetics, here seeing, quote, Equiano Vasa's religious conversion as metonymic of the larger ongoing attempt on the part of this particular black flesh person to be saved within into the white men's world. Such attempts on the part of many, if not most, in the Black Atlantic worlds also constitute a layered and complex history of representations, resistance, flight, accommodation, survival, all masquerade, end quote. Here is an invitation, as Wimbush suggests, not out of masking, but to greater, and for many of us more distressing self-reflexivity about the multiple masks and masquerades in which we are entangled. As he said to me about a film we both watched, no one can just get out. But I hope that for many of us, witnessing this virtual exhibition in a time of enforced masking is an invitation to the borders of apocalypse, a change in the forms of scripturalization that have relied on violent veilings and unveilings. Like everything, this online exhibition will be experienced differently depending on who you are. In decolonizing diasporas, you might have seen Figueroa Vasquez draws upon Michelle Cliff's notion of apocalypso, where, quote, the other appears to be the one, end quote. Cliff, a paler complected Jamaican author, reflected on an experience where her pale privilege brought her into spaces where her very presence triggered in others a confusion of naturalized systems of categorization. In observing this about Cliff's work, Figueroa Vasquez further describes apocalypso as, quote, a cataclysmic failure, end quote, of meaning regimes, a failure of dominant smooth narration, a cracking in the epistemic armor. In short, apocalypso is not an unveiling, but a space where the mask crack and the masquerade shifts tune. Where the metaphor of the veil has been scripturalized through certain readings of the book of Revelation, perhaps this exhibition on masquerades viewed virtually during our current moment of unending apocalypse enforcing us to don literal masks may offer something else. For many of us, an X-centric apocalypso, a fracture of meaning regimes, a meta exhibition played within the veil and between the masks. Thank you.